Awesome. Welcome, Netroots Nation 2023. How's everybody? Woo! <laughs> I love that. Uh, energy in the crowd and energy at the table. <laughs> I love it. This is fantastic. Well, thank you so much for attending this session here. I think we have a really special session. In front of you today are gathered four absolutely phenomenal state party chairs. Now, many of you are active in your state parties. Maybe you knock doors, spend time on the phones. Uh, maybe you attend all of the countless and interminable meetings. Maybe <laughs> you throw house parties. You know the work that it takes to, the everyday work that it takes to keep a state party running. In front of you are chairs, leaders of their own states, I'll introduce very briefly, just shortly, um, who are chairs cut from a, a little bit of a different cloth. These aren't chairs who we may have seen in a previous generation, people who've been there and um, you know, often resemble each other no matter where in the country you are. These are chairs who are active, mm -hmm. who bring a movement mentality, who themselves did work to come up, uh, maybe not always in the traditional way, maybe not always in a way that was or was not contested, but these are chairs that are building a party in their own states. I'll briefly go over each one of them and then I'll toss them some questions and we can get started. How does that sound? Awesome. Right next to me, we have Shasti Conrad from Washington. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Anderson Clayton from North Carolina. Me breeze. <laughs> Lavora Barnes from Michigan. Woo! And Jane Klebb from Nebraska. Woo! So I'm gonna get right into it and start asking some of these questions. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Well, you've each been elected chairs of your representative, uh, of your respective state Democratic Party, but your backgrounds and the way that you've risen into this position are all unconventional, we'll say. Uh, quite different. So tell us about that. Tell us a little bit about the story of how you've become the chair of your party and one thing that you've learned from that journey. Shasta, why don't you start? Great. Hi everyone, um, it is great to be here with all of you today. And yeah, I you know this was never the big plan. <laughs> I never thought that I would be um, chair of my state party, but actually my activism um, really was what fueled me getting involved in my local party organizations. And it's I was just elected this past January into this role exactly almost 20 years um, before or after I uh, first became involved in our state party as uh, as an intern when I was in college. And I went to college during the Bush administration. And you know there was a lot of movement around anti-war protests and my peers in high school had gone off to the Iraq war. And the party was sort of that place where I felt like I could contribute or I could be around other like-minded folks who were also passionate about trying to stop the sort of um, corrosive movements that were happening from the Republican party. And I stepped away from the party for a number of years and it was actually um, Bernie Sanders of all people who really inspired me to get back into the party back in 2016. I worked on the 2016 campaign and through that process, I think many of us who are part of that movement saw how the structure of the Democratic Party played an outsized role in how and who had a seat at the table. And so I decided that, you know, Oh, really on his urging, like so many of us, that we needed to go in and try to change these structures to make it so that there were room for more progressives who could set the rules, who could influence the policies and the platform that were being put forth by the Democratic Party. And, uh, and so I got involved in my local party organization. I ran for a state Senate uh, vacancy that the only bright spot of November 2016 in our state was that Pramila Jayapal was elected um, to Congress and now leads the Progressive Caucus um, for, for Congress. And, um, and so I ran to fill her vacancy. And I came in third out of eight candidates. And so I, I lost that seat. But... I got involved in the party. I got to meet my neighbors and community members and they asked me to get involved in the party. And through that work, then I eventually became chair of our largest county party, King County. I was the first woman of color to lead that organization and uh, was there for the last four years. And then when this opportunity presented itself to step forward into the state party, I felt like this was a great way to channel um, that sort of progressive energy, but really to make an impact on the state and, and, and also at the DNC of really showing that there's a place for us in this party as well. 
and I'm the first woman of color to lead the state party. I'm our youngest chair ever, um, and I'm the first Asian American um, to lead a state party for either party in the entire country. And so, thank you. Um, so I'm just very, I'm very proud of that, and I want to use that as an opportunity to demonstrate this next generation of Democratic Party leadership. Speaking of next generation, Anderson, tell us about. Hey, y'all. Um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Really happy to be here with Netroots today. My name is Anderson Clayton. I use she, her pronouns. And um, ultimately, I think that my journey in politics started when I got into college for the first time. Um, I'm from a really rural part of North Carolina. Uh, it's called uh, Person County, Roxboro. Uh, it's on the Virginia border in North Carolina. And so I, the two things that I grew up not or saying or people telling you that you shouldn't be talking about, right, were religion and politics at the dinner table. And so I carried that throughout most of my life. And I thought that I wanted to be a journalist going into college, and I want to be the next Anderson Cooper, not Anderson Clayton in some cases, and I'm still trying to get on a show with him one of these days to tell him that in person. I wrote him a letter when I was in sixth grade, and I was like, I could come take over AC360 <laughs> if you let me. Um, <clears throat> but I got in uh, to college, and I, there, um, in 2016, when Republicans in North Carolina were looking at, you know, how do we disenfranchise students the most? Because we know that when students turn out and vote, uh, Democrats win elections, honestly. And they tried to strip all of the college campus voting sites for early voting um, at, throughout the UNC system in North Carolina. And they were successful um, on all of them. Talking about places like NC State, UNC Chapel Hill, Duke, honestly, all of these places where you would expect there to be a polling site on campus. Uh, but there was a little tiny town in the mountains of North Carolina called Watauga County. And Watauga County said, hell to the no, y'all ain't taking our voting site off of Appalachian State's campus because when y'all do that, we lose elections, right? And so what they did, this little tiny town decided, we're going to sue the State Board of Elections. We're going to get lawyers and we're going to take these their asses to court, to be honest with y'all. And that's exactly what they did. And in 2016, when, when North Carolina went red, Watauga County went blue for the first time in its history, y'all. And that is the power of when people get young folks involved with politics and when a party puts money behind where, where their mouth is, right? Engaging with young people. And so uh, that was the big fight that got me involved. And up until 2021, I joked with people that was my first win in politics and that had been my only win in politics for a while. Um, and some folks in this room, they're like, Anderson, I've been in politics a whole heck of a lot longer than you. And those are pretty fast wins in some cases. But um, in 2021, though, I came back, I had spent the last or couple years on national campaigns and uh, I'd worked in Iowa for the Iowa caucuses. I'd been in Tennessee. I'd been in Kentucky with Amy McGrath's campaign. Um, and one of the things that I left 2020 really fed up with was the way that the National Party had looked at organizing in rural communities. Uh, like I said, I was from a rural area. I, I really do believe that the opportunity that the Democratic Party has to rebuild trust in communities that we've broken, particularly in the rural South, when we think about how diverse uh, and honestly a sleeping giant that I really do believe that is in our party right now is the opportunity to go in and engage black and brown voters in the rural South. And so for me, I was like, I got to go back home. I don't know what else to do besides like go back to my roots and start from where I know that organizing matters the most, which is in your own backyard. Because going out and being dropped into places where you're trying to regain those relationships and build them up is not always the best way to do something, right? And so I came back to Person County and I started getting involved locally and I became chair of my county party by accident. Charles Harvey, who was the county chair before me, looked at me and he said, I'm not doing this anymore, Anderson. I've been here for eight freaking years and I'm tired of y'all by now. And I said, rightfully so, which is the problem we've got in a lot of places and with democratic leadership is being able to rebuild uh, democratic armies across counties. And so I took over that county party and we flipped to Roxburgh City Council in 2021 with three really amazing Democrats that now sit on that council. And it was a great victory, but it's something that should have happened in Person County a lot, or a long time before that, to be honest with y'all. And that's what really is the driving force for me to run for state party chair, because, you know, we got elected three really amazing black Democrats because we had sat found a rural county that had 51% of its city population were black Democrats and black folks. And so for me, the opportunity that the party had not taken in my home county in a long time was something that we had to correct and something that we need to do across North Carolina in general. And so so I ran for state party chair because I was angry. I ran with an army of young people across the state that were dedicated to getting organized and taking in leadership roles throughout the state and are energized in order to be able to take back North Carolina in 2024 from the Republican extremism that we have. And we know it starts at the grassroots level. So thank you all for being here today and spending your time with us, y'all. First, Nat Roots, definitely not my last. Thank you all for welcoming Woo. me. 
terrific. Um, so yeah, I'm LaVora Barnes. I always worked in politics. It's the only thing I know how to do. I do it pretty well, damn well, but it's the only thing I know how to do. Um, I tell people the story of I spent one year in private world and hated it, was bored out of my mind because I was given a full week to write a press release. It takes me 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> So politics is absolutely where I belong. Um, I'd worked uh, mostly as an organizer on the ground, a campaign manager. I spent years as a caucus director in a state house caucus that won and then lost a majority. Um, awful. Um, and then was a state director for Obama. I came to the party first as executive director, because that's what I do, right? I, I, I make the programs work. Um, and what I wanted to build for the candidates that I had been working for for years was a party that actually provided the sort of infrastructure that helped them come in, set up quickly, and run strong campaigns. My belief was, if you had a state party that was organizing all the time, everywhere, more candidates would win. Turns out I was right. <laughs> <laughs> And some winning happened. But I have to say that the, the work that we did to get here and that all of these ladies are doing also to get these state parties here is such hard work. So I'm here to say thank you, all of you, for agreeing to do this work because it is probably the most thankless work folks can do in politics, running a state party. Um, someone said to me the other day that state parties are like fire hydrants. You get pissed on <laughs> until they need you to save their life. Oh, and it's wow. true. It's true. It's, it's hard, hard work. But I'm thrilled to do the work. I am, I'm, I'm so thrilled to, to have other state party chairs who um, look like me now. We have black women running state parties all over the country now. We have women running state parties all over the country. When I first ran, I was absolutely an anomaly. There was no one for me to look to and say, how do you as a black woman run a battleground state? There was no one. Um, and I'm happy to be that someone for the next group of women who come up to run these races. So thrilled to be here, happy to answer all questions and just a warning if you ask me i will answer folks from michigan know this so if you don't want to hear the answer don't ask <laughs> believe it uh, hey everybody it's good to be here uh always an honor to be with fellow state chairs especially fellow female chairs uh and chair barnes is correct when i looked at the room of state party chairs at our last asdc our state party association for chairs and vice chairs meeting I was so happy to see younger, more diverse, a lot more women. It's just, it's pretty remarkable, rural, suburban, and urban chairs. So I do feel like there is real change happening within the Democratic Party infrastructure, and that's testament to all the pressure that many of you in the audience and online are doing to our state parties in the DNC. Um, I came to the state party, I think, in a you know, unique way, like many of us. I really started out in my early career as a young issue activist, I was living in DC at the time, was protesting the WTO and the Iraq war. Um, and one of my friends, Paul Yandura, uh, now my children's godfather, uh, was working in the Clinton administration. He pulled a few of us aside and said, look, like I get it, I'm angry about these things too, but if you uh, wanna impact change, you also have to be in partisan politics. You need to elect better people that represent the values and the issues that you care about. So I took that to heart. I became the Young Democrats of America ex Executive Director because I love running Woo! programs. Um, we ran a historic Young Voter Alliance project that was modeled for many campaigns and still is. Um, I took on the DNC at the time. I was a thorn in their side. They didn't have youth quotas to the Democratic conventions. Uh, we were handing out flyers at the DNC meeting. We were told we weren't allowed to do that. Eventually, you know, we now have youth quotas for the DNC convention, so every state party has to send a certain amount of young people so their voices are heard. Um, we created the youth council at the DNC when I was the head of the Young Dems. And then um, I met a cute rancher uh, who lived in Nebraska, Scott Klebb. He was a net roots, uh, at the time yearly coast, back for the old school folks. Uh, he was a hero of many of you. Um, so we, I moved to Nebraska. And I thought honestly that I would be welcomed with open armed at the state party and at, the, at my local county party. And I was told very quickly that we don't need you. We don't need your style of politics. 
and you don't wear cowboy boots with dresses. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I decided to organize outside the state party and build power. I created a group called Bold Nebraska. We took on the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, we, yeah. uh, <laughs> we got Senator Nelson's vote on Obamacare also. So I, you know, was very frustrated, and this was in the Bernie years of 2016, that the state party was really ignoring the Bernie people in our state and was treating them like they weren't Democrats um, because they were Democrats of a different you know, ideology. They were not embracing the, it takes two wings to fly. They weren't embracing, it takes all shades of blue. And so I knew that uh, when Bernie won the caucuses in Nebraska, that we would have the majority of delegates in the uh, convention. So I knew that was my time to run. So I had two months to run. Uh, I won. I beat you know, a very establishment candidate that every single elected official in our state was behind. But we did it through organizing. Uh, we started with 500 Democrats elected statewide. We now have over 900 Democrats elected statewide. Woo! We still have a long way to go, um, but I'm happy to be in. And in red states, just for folks that don't know this, most state party chairs in red states are unpaid. So I'm an unpaid, essentially full-time volunteer for our state party. So I still get to keep my foot in activism. I'm still running bold, still fighting pipelines uh, and doing all that good stuff. Amazing. Let's hear it again for this amazing crew of state party chairs. <laughs> when you look up here at these state party chairs, I think of a number of things are striking. First, that you aren't all you know, 75 year old white men. <laughs> I think that's extraordinary. But the other thing that I think is extraordinary about this is that these are state party chairs from red states, blue states, purple states, and all of them climb their way up in a sometimes hostile party, in a sometimes hostile establishment, and organized and built, and built power. That's not always easy though. Our party, I think, is often described as a coalition party made up of many different groups constituencies, factions, if you like. Um, and each of our chairs had to learn something about that in terms of working with. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what are some of the lessons that you've learned as you've dealt with, worked with, and maybe even bridged some of the different groups that comprise our party? Let me throw it to Anderson first. Yeah, um, I think about this a lot in the context of young people. Uh, and what role young people feel like they can play right now in the Democratic Party. And I kind of have a saying of, you know, both parties are broken, but there's only one party that's worth fixing, in my opinion, and that's able to be fixed, just to be honest. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that is the Democratic Party. And I really try to encourage young people to take the place of, it's your opportunity to get involved with this party and to push your way through it. Uh, Jane had a story that I think is really relevant to, to us and, and to me and to a couple other state party chairs that got elected in the last little bit of just, it was a fight to get here. Um, I came up with a, a incumbent chair that was someone who was part of the establishment, had been endorsed by my governor, my attorney general, all seven members of Congress. And I think that the role that young people played in my election was really giving a, a validity scope to what we had to do. And we went around the state and we organized and I went to all of the counties that I could possibly get out to. I took a month off from my job and ran a state party chair race with the help of a, a donor that honestly came in and said, we want to see a young person in charge of this. And we believe in a vision that you're putting out here right now of organizing in all 100 counties. And we proved to people that young people can do this. Because I think that for me, I'm, I'm the youngest state party chair in the country right now. I'm 25 and I'm very excited about that. But it also comes with a lot of pressure. And I think that that pressure is... Um, emblematic of the way that this party puts pressure on young people in this day and age right now is to figure out, you know, if you're not automatically behind Joe Biden or if you're not excited about this party, then you're the problem. And I'm like, no, the party is the problem. And the party is the thing that needs to be fixed because we need to be able to call everybody that doesn't see themselves right now in this party into this party. And the only way that we do that is by getting new people elected into positions of power that may not have ever seen themselves in that space, right? And that only comes from having people in here that never saw themselves in it beforehand too, I think. And so the real mission that we've challenged ourselves to do in North Carolina is that I had a lot of rebuilding to do after I got elected. I had a divided party. And so we went on kind of like a little unity tour and I started talking to every elected official I had in that state. Uh, we went on a big fundraising kick and we also made sure that they knew that I was, I was gonna run this like a full-time operation. I'm also a part-time party chair in the sense of North Carolina gives their party chair a $33,000 stipend right now. And so it's not a full-time job. I think there's only around seven state party chairs that are paid full-time. And I think that there's a 
real inhibitor to that, but you're also seeing a lot more people rise up in these positions with the help of folks on the ground and really coalition building in our own party about these are the ways that we want to see working people in positions of power again, young people in positions of power again, people of color in positions of power again that we haven't seen internally to our party structure in a really long time. Or ever. Forever, forever. <laughs> if I could take an X, Laura. Yeah, I, I will say in Michigan, <laughs> we have a big tent full of really terrific folks, and um, I, I feel like it, it's my job to make sure that everybody gets a ticket into the tent and a chance at the mic once they're inside. Doesn't mean that we run this sort of process in Michigan where the minority gets to rule. We make decisions about what we do as a democratic family and then we move forward. And one of the hardest things I think in terms of building those coalitions inside is to help people understand that when you haven't won the vote, it doesn't mean you take your toys and go home. It means you stay and you work toward the next thing and you keep organizing and working hard and being part of the process. And I think that just allowing folks in Michigan to have that voice was so new to some people because they were so accustomed to having been shut down um, previously. And you know, I, I'm as patient as you can be and I will let you stand at that mic and say whatever you want as long as you want. But then we're gonna move on and we're gonna go get to work. And my mantra has been since I got there, does it, does it, whatever it is, does it help us achieve our goal? And the goal of this Democratic Party is electing Democrats, period. And if whatever it is that we are doing or saying does not serve that purpose, then we need to stop doing and saying it. And that's been my, my, my role, my job, and also a little bit of cheerleader, right? A little bit of arm around the shoulder. It's okay, I know you didn't get it this time, but we're gonna help you get it the next time. A little bit of let's organize better, even inside the party, right? Organize better so that if you wanna be on State Central, next time you'll win, right? It's not, like, but everybody needs to learn how to organize and be part of the family and be a part of what we're doing. Last thing I'll say, because it's happening in Michigan right now, we have a primary going on, a big U.S. Senate primary, an important U.S. Senate primary, a U.S. Senate seat we're going to win. Woo! But while we're, while we're having this primary, one of my jobs is also to say things like, folks, you can support whoever you want in this primary. I encourage you to knock doors, make phone calls, work hard for the candidate you believe in. And then we're gonna all link arms behind the one who wins in the primary and go win the seat. And also along the way, let's not tear up Democrats because we are a family. It is one tent of all of us. And if we tear up Democrats for the Republicans, then we've given them all the ammunition and all of the energy and all of the time to tear up Democrats from their side as well. So it's ongoing, always something new and different that we have to talk about in terms of our coalition, but the goal is to allow everybody that ticket inside that big Democratic tit. If you wanna be a Democrat, please join us. Amen. So some of the concrete things we did when I first got elected chair, it was obviously very contentious, so folks remember after the Bernie and Hillary fight, our state parties were really torn apart. Uh, and even still on the national convention floor, you know, you had state delegations that were torn apart um, and feel in a lot of hard feelings. So I made it a clear point to appoint half Bernie, half Hillary people to our committee chairs. So the rules chair platform, it was half and half. I didn't do 70-30, it was half and half. I really believed that once uh, Clinton folks who may not have known some of the Bernie folks who came into the party brand new, that once they started seeing them do the hard work and caring about the things and wanting to elect Democrats, that attitudes would change and feelings would change, and that's exactly what happened. When you go through battles inside a state party, because it is a battle, I think, you know, we we have a lot to complain about the DNC or state parties, but you know we are institutions that are carrying on the Democratic brand uh, for years to come, right? And literally centuries to come. Uh, other progressive groups will come and go. That's just the reality, and the Democratic Party will always be there. And so how are we making sure that that is stronger? And we're dealing with issues right now. I'm sure all of us are. You know, 
Lavore is dealing with a, a contested primary. We dealt with that in our congressional race at one time. We're dealing now with some of our more progressive Dems want to censure one of our Democrats for voting um, against women's reproductive freedom. And this is a real challenge that all of us face. And what is that balance that you do of keeping your mission of electing Democrats and also standing with communities that are hurt and that are being um, marginalized by Republican-led uh, elected officials with the help, unfortunately, sometimes of some of our fellow Democrats. So those are the challenges I think that we face, but I continue my mantra that all shades of blue are what's going to make our party stronger, um, and that when you go through these struggles together, that's when you come out stronger on the other side. And I just wanted to add that, you know, I often say that we operate at the speed of trust. And so I recognize as I go into different, you know, conversations, different communities, that it's going to take time and that not always am I going to win over someone, you know, immediately that first time that they're meeting me. But I often also say, like, watch me work, you know, watch me do the work, watch me, watch how I'm building. I want you to be a part of that work, but I understand it's going to take time. And I want you to be able to see that, you know, I'm going to show up. I'm going to stay true to my word. I'm never going to overpromise and underdeliver. And then, you know, we'll see where we where we land. I'm in a blue state um, on the surface, although we have very red parts of our state. Um, and, you know, I was a chair of the largest uh, county, bluest county in the state. And, you know, now in this cycle, we have a once in a 20 year cycle where our governor has just announced that he's retiring, Governor Inslee. And so I am going to have D on D races in every single one of my statewides. Mm -hmm. um, and so I see that my job is to sort of what Lavora was saying is to make sure that as we go through this, people feel like the process has been fair, that we've been allowed to have the de a debate and a discussion about who is best to lead in these different roles, who is able, who's listening, who and let them make the case to voters to and to everyone in our state. And then we have to be able to come back together and make sure that we get our best person. And we can't let a Republican get a foothold and take back any of these seats in any level of government. And so that, I think, is what I see my role as, and it really listening. I think it's a, it's a job. This job is mostly listening, being a therapist at times, um, being a cheerleader. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to put an underline on is what both Jane and um, Anderson were saying around being a paid state party chair. I am one of those seven who is paid. And I can't imagine doing this work without being a full-time salaried job. And I also don't think people in my generation or people that come from like a background, you know, my mom was a single mom, working parent, I, we don't come from money. And when I came into this job, a fundraiser said to me, you know, your predecessor was a millionaire. She knows all these people. What can you do? We don't want you. You're not the kind of person that we want in a role like this. And I said, nope. You, you absolutely need me. I'm going to be in this role. I'm going to be doing this work, but I need to get paid to be able to do it because I can't do this as a hobby. And so this is a movement that is really important to me and the DNC is to really fighting and advocating so that all of my fellow chairs can get adequately paid for this. Like We are standing up for democracy here. This is life and death work, and we should be all respected and validated in that work. So I just wanted to yeah. put that exclamation point on that. Thank you, Shasti. I think that's really important. One of the themes that I've noted uh, for all of your answers in building bridges, a big piece of it is doing the work and getting results. You have to actually win. You actually have to move the ball forward. Um, so I want to ask my next question about, you know, you've taken the reins. You're building the party. Tell us something, and you've brought a more active, movement-oriented mindset, but tell us something that that's concrete you've done as chair, something that maybe other states can take away, something that is a result that you've you've built or maybe you're you're new and you're building at. Um, Jane, do you want to start us off? I know you had something. Yeah, uh, and I love show and tell. I'm a mom, so <laughs> I brought lots of materials for folks to take. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of those and then pass the mic, of course, to uh, my fellow chairs. I, when I became chair, it was really important for me that we had very concrete things that we could prove to donors, to the activists, and to candidates on what the state party provides. It's a constant question that we get, what does the state party do other than the voter file? Shout out to folks in the back, Lou and others with, you know, Van that help us with that beautiful voter file uh, and DDX and others that are in the room. Um, 
but I wanted to make sure that we had programs. So we do a voter guide for every single county that lists every single candidate in that county, whether they're running for school board, public power board, or they're on the top of the ticket. And that takes a lot of research. If you've never done that for 93 counties, that's a lot of work since we have counties that uh, are literally working on fax machines still in Nebraska, <laughs> so that's fun. Um, we created a vote by mail uh, program, which is really robust now, which was really not in operation. Um, and then we created this thing called the Block Captain Program. What I was hearing as I did a tour across the state of Nebraska was people knew about a precinct captain program, but that was essentially 2,500 or more Democrats. And they were like, as one person, I cannot take on talking to 2,500 folks in my community. So we created a Block Captain Program. I have our little Block Captain Guide from a couple previous years that you can come and take. We give it to state parties for free. Um, essentially, you get assigned 50 voters in your community. So you don't have to drive and use minivan to talk to voters. They're folks who you probably see at church or at the coffee shop or in your community at our kids' soccer games. And we give you three actions to do every single year. And we do training online right before that action. So sometimes it's a issue survey. Uh, this fall, it's gonna be handing out what's called Dems Deliver. It's a newspaper we're making that talks about all the legislative wins we got in the session, the losses, how we're building, et cetera. Um, so concrete programs are critical. The other concrete program that we did is we created a whole rural outreach project. Some of you may be offended by some of the materials up here. Like one of them says, keep your land, keep your beef, keep your gun. Uh, in rural communities, uh, those are very important things to rural people, especially in agriculture-based communities. And the Republicans are constantly saying that we're coming to take their land by the 30 by 30 program or some other boogeyman that they do, but we're very big on protecting people's property rights, even more so than the Republican Party, and that includes every single Democratic Party across the country. So we thought it was important to create a program to really show that in a red state, in a rural state. So. Having concrete programs shows value to our donors, to our monthly donors, to candidates, so they know what we provide versus what they as candidates have to provide. Because everybody up here will tell you also that some candidates really believe that once they put their name on the ballot that we run their campaigns. Uh, and that we provide all the money for their campaigns. And so there's a lot of learning that you have to do to candidates as well. That's so what? true. <laughs> <laughs> Not only do you think we run their campaigns, we also are supposed to write them checks. So run the campaign and give me money. Um, uh, when, when I came to the party, as I said, I was intent on grassroots organizing all over the state. So we built a program which is now semi-famous called Project 83 for the 83 counties in Michigan. Um, the, the decision we took early on, and I say we because I was the executive director when we started this program, but it, it my program. Um, but the decision we took was we didn't fill some headquarters positions um, so that we could afford the Project 83 organizers because we had to prove the point. We had to prove that it would work before donors would come in and help support the program. Um, so you know, luckily, apparently, I, I can take on anything and just do it myself. So as people left, I just took their jobs, right? So, <laughs> Fine, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it, it's fine. Hire more organizers. So that's how we got this program off the, off the ground. And one of the things I say to other state party chairs who's like, I don't know where to start, is that there's always a place to start. Even if you start with one organizer, which is one more organizer than you had, you're making progress and you're doing something successful for your state party. So that program has been in place since 2017. These organizers are some of the most seasoned and best organizers in the country. They remain on all the time. They don't move over to the coordinated campaign. They stay focused on their areas the entire time, working with down ballot candidates who frankly often get overlooked maybe always get overlooked, yeah. to be honest. Um, and, and so they are very hands-on making sure we're winning. And this is why we are, are now, we're in school board races now because we have to be in school board Ooh. races. And that's like the biggest victory for me while 2022 was huge in Michigan. When I can say that we worked on 212 school board races and won 197 of them, that's a big deal too. Uh That's, that's the program that like, I'm trying to sell everywhere across the country and help donors understand if you help Breezy over here um, <laughs> get a grassroots organizing program stood up in North Carolina, that's how we make the difference in North Carolina, right? So 
breezy. Yeah. Um, no, I'll be honest. The first phone call I made when I got in this job was to a one Lavora Barnes um, to figure out how they did what they did in Michigan. And I'm on the level of building out that program now. Um, but we are going to be able to put three organizers on the ground in August um, across North Carolina. And so we're really excited about being able to, to build that because we know when we've seen a successful state party and what it looks like in Michigan, that that's what happens. And I think that the other thing that we've done really successfully since we've been in is the just showing up. There's one thing that I think people have always said about the Democratic Party over the last two years is that we have a messaging problem. Um, and I'll be honest with y'all, I kind of push back on that. I don't think we have a messaging problem. I think we have a showing up problem, and we just don't do it. In communities and in places that we actually need to be in, candidates have taken this approach as to where, you know, I can raise all of this money, and that's going to get me a win in some cases. And I'm like, no, people still want to shake your hand. Maybe in this day and age with a little uh, COVID, we want a little elbow touch, and we want to know, you know, what are you actually about, and who are you as a person? Are you a public servant, or are you a politician? And, like, what is the difference in that for you? Are you here to serve communities, or are you not? And for me, the, the Democratic Party in North Carolina had taken the approach of that we are a Raleigh-centric party and we don't touch the other corners of our state. Um, North, North Carolina, to make it across it, is eight hours. And I know that because I have driven that in the last two months, three months, and we'll continue to do that over the next two years because I know that the important part of getting out in rural communities and teaching them how to organize is also showing up and, and showing them they're not the only ones they're trying to do it with. And so, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, I want to give my predecessor actually a little bit of credit, which is I think the state party in previous iterations was very much a gatekeeper type of entity, right? It was basically there that like a select few got to make the decision about who would be sort of crowned as like the person that would be moving forward at, at every level of government. And my predecessor really, you know, in this sort of era post-Trump, uh, during Trump, was really about like, no, we've got to, like Lavor saying, we have to be organizing every race, every place. We need to be making sure that we have candidates that are prepared and that are ready to run at, in every level of government. And so I was able to actually walk into a fairly well, like we had a foundation that was built in the state party. And I, so one of the things that I really saw was that I get to build on that and make sure that while we are doing this type of organizing work, who's in the room? You know, who has typically not had a seat at the table? And where, like you're saying about going into like these rural communities, but also communities of color, young people, where are we going? And, and those folks who've often felt like the party was not their home. And I really want to build a place where people feel like this party is their party, that this is a place where they can come and do good work and feel like they are contributing, feel like whether it's writing a postcard or whether it is running for office, but that there is a role for everyone to play and that this is where you can do that and feel like you are you have something to offer and that there's a family in some degree of what we're of what we're building I think also we're all burnt out and exhausted from the last like seven years of having to be in resistance mode and we have let this work become drudgery and we have got to add fun back into it. We have got to like appreciate our volunteers. We've got to enjoy, go to the fish fries, have a pizza party, do something that actually makes us remember why we like doing this. And it's about people, it's about community, it's about being with people who care, who see their fellow you know, um, community members and like wanna help and actually do something that's gonna make a difference in people's lives. And that's the messaging that I think is actually, it's like the showing up, it's like we've got got to be churning that into the ether and reminding people that we there's something good here that we can be a part of. That's great. Thank you. I, I have to reflect on this because so a long time ago, almost 20 years ago, um, I joined this organization called Democracy for America and our whole thing was we want to train people up and under the assumption that we should be fighting everywhere, every corner of every state, every county of every state, every district, and people should be showing up. And so we did that. And as our activists started showing up, it was a Democratic Party that said, no, we don't need you. Actually, we don't need your kind here. And it was rough. It, we would do, we would do uh, candidate trainings, and one party, I'll just say it, the Virginia State uh, Democratic Party, actually sent an email out to warn people against coming to a candidate training, which is great because their list was bigger than ours, and it was a great recruitment tool. <laughs> It's fantastic. Thank you, Virginia, from 18 years ago. Um, but seeing and hearing that state party chairs are doing this work now and that it's working and that it has results and there are concrete programs, mm -hmm. this is, to me, it just it makes my heart sing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then one quick thing, Jane, I know you love show and tell. Would you hold up your stuff again one more time? <laughs> yes. Is this, is this thing, is, this is things that other people can Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, absolutely. Break? This is our block captain guide. We have some fun stickers. We have, we do a lot of outreach to formerly incarcerated folks. So we have a card there that they can put in their pocket to know how they can re-register to vote. Register vote with QR codes. Uh, we have, this is the keep your land, keep your uh, beef. We have, we often get at like county fairs and state fairs, what does the party believe in? So we did a Nebraska Democrats Believe uh, flyer. And then we did a rural bill of rights, which is something that a lot of rural state parties have started to do. So folks know what we're standing for. Cool that. You should also uh, get Jane's book, Harvest yes. the Vote, uh, which is an amazing uh, guide on rural organizing. And yeah, she really is the Book author. plug, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one more question for y'all, and, and if we have some time, we'll leave it up for the for the for the folks in the audience. But I want to summarize this: organizing is a really difficult uh, task. It comes with countless and often unpredictable challenges, and a lot of lessons learned, which is a nice way of saying we don't always win; we sometimes fail quite often. In terms of lessons learned, as a state party chair or or any role that you've had active as an activist or in your party, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned in doing the work that you've done? Maybe choose one. How about that? I, I, I can start. Is that all right? Go for it. Um, I, I think, in the spirit of the conversations we've been having here, let's start with um, be everywhere, run everywhere, try everywhere is, is the lesson. I think I came from a, a caucus perspective where we were very targeted at the caucus, right? We would choose our seats and we would invest our time and our money into those specific seats and sort of let the others language, frankly. Um, and what I've learned um, in the state party world is that if you are organizing everywhere and trying to run candidates everywhere, because I don't know if you all know this, but not every state party contests every race everywhere. Um, we, we contest every race. That's an organization that's very helpful. Um, but we, we, we run everywhere. Like Our goal is to have a Democrat running in every seat everywhere. And while... While we won't win, we will increase the conversations on the ground about the issues we care about. And I believe we also increase turnout from the bottom up, right? Because you are more likely to show up at the polling place because you are voting for your neighbor than you are to show up at the polling place because you're voting for Joe Biden, for instance. Yep. So we wanna make sure that we've got candidates running everywhere who are on those doors, on those phones, turning up interest, turning up excitement. So that's lesson number one. And lesson number two is that there is value in each and every individual within the party and each and every voter. I think that you know we are often quick to write someone off because of how they vote or because of what they have done or said in the past. And there's a place to find for everybody, a place to find common ground. As I say, inside our tent, there is more that binds us together than tears us apart. And we have to remember that and say it like a mantra over and over again, because when the days get hard and when it's your own Dems coming after you, you have to remind yourself over and over again that there is more that brings us together than tears us apart and that we are not each other's enemy. Thank you. Mm. Who else has got a lesson for us? You know, I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is that we welcome all these outside groups that are doing kind of similar functions of the state party um, while also standing up for ourselves, right? Because, you know, it's very difficult to hear sometimes outside groups bash state parties or bash the DNC uh, without really coming and visiting with us, saying to us, let's do a candidate training together, um, you know, let's do candidate recruitment together. And so in our state, unlike, you know, I think Michigan and other states that have had this already, I always say, you know, Nebraska comes to the party like 10 years later. Like in our town, we just got a Starbucks. Um, you know, we just got one of those frozen yogurt places. And so, you know, it's like, and we just got boba tea. So it's like, you know, we come to things later. But we're just creating a coordinated donor table and a coordinated kind of C4 Ooh. state party table. And it's been really wonderful because again, when you walk through the fire with each other, you start to build trust and uh, all of those kind of petty things start to fall away because you realize that we're all headed towards the same goal. And so that's my biggest lesson is that when 
a state party may feel threatened that actually go to that group and start to say, how can we do things together? Where are the challenges? You know, how can we be doing it? And then my other, you know, lesson has been, I, I know the DNC sometimes see me and a couple other state party chairs as thorns in their side. And I love the institution of the Democratic Party. I deeply believe in the institutions of our state parties, our county parties, and the DNC. And sometimes I push for structural changes, rule changes, because I do believe in the institutions and that it's never enough just to do a patch, um, you know, we'll do it for this meeting. Like, no, unless it's in the bylaws, uh, it doesn't matter. So I do a lot of work at changing bylaws in our state to make sure that it is more, more progressive, more inclusive, um, and we have a a DNC chair who deeply believes in that as well. You know, Chair Harrison comes from the state party infrastructure and has treated us so differently uh, and so much growth is happening in that level. And so that's the other lesson is like, keep on pushing. If you're frustrated at your state party, if you're frustrated at the DNC, stay at the table and fight. Nice, good one. I, uh, the two things that I have are, hey, you can't organize who you don't love, and I think that that's a really big <laughs> yeah. part of, of this space is that we can easily hate people on the other side of an aisle or on a different side of a disagreement with us, whether that be like Republicans or our own party. Um, and, and I think that it's still a mantra that I try to say in my head everywhere that I go is that, you know, you can't organize who you don't love. Um, and the other part of that is remember your why. When I decided to run for state party chair, everyone told me not to, um, <laughs> including like elected officials. I remember going to a state senator's house in North Carolina, honestly, and telling him I was going to do this and crying my eyes out afterwards because he looked at me and he said, you need to go back to Person County, Anderson, and just sit there for a while. Um, and I feel like that's what this job is in some cases is being told no um, and being in organizing spaces is being told no and figuring out ways that you're going to go around and circumvent that. And I had someone that looked at me and they said, Anderson, if you're going to do this and you're going to ruin yourself in politics, you might as well remember your why, <laughs> because that's what I was. That's what people told me I was doing when I started to do this is like you're going to ruin yourself um, or your political career. Anything that you want to do in your life is going to come down to this. And I was like. God, that's pretty daunting to know it as, as a 24-year-old, which is what I was when I started to run for this. Um, but I remembered why I got in this, because I was angry, because I had something to fight for, and because people across North Carolina were worth it, right? And that's what we need to remember in every single space that you're in, is that the people that you're fighting for are worth it, whether or not the people around you or in front of you believe that sometimes. So thank you all for the work that you do. Yeah. All right. So here's what we're gonna do next. Um, it's always it's always a fun time when we hand the microphone off to the audience. So if we can get our lovely, wonderful, talented tech crew to get an extra, there's an extra wireless mic, yeah? Awesome. And can I get somebody to volunteer to be a runner? To run around the room, yes. <laughs> What's your name? Mariana. Mariana, thank you, Mariana. All right, so if you've got a question, Mariana's gonna come to you with the microphone. I'm gonna call on you though. Um, and so raise your hand if you've got a question. Yep. All right, over here, I get to look indistinct how I'm pointing, but let's the first, yes, yes, you. Hi, Chris McDonald, pronouns he, him, his. I've, I'm 34 years old. I've been campaigning since I was 19, mm -hmm. uh, my first campaign. But I want to know, uh, I've been very thankful to go from organizer to a director. I don't know why I did that, I was a director. Anyways, my question is, even when I work on campaigns, trying to hire people is hard because you're trying to find those people who are passionate, have skills. For my question is, what is a state party's commitment to teach young Democrats of their county or state or ch party chair or county chairs how to use Van? Because it's still mind-boggling to me <laughs> now that someone who's used Van in 13 states, I'll meet people who are directors themselves on campaigns, but they don't know how to use Van. Yeah. So yeah. what, and creating like that, that G leak to bring people up from apparently like a young Democrat to someone who's an organizer on a campaign? Who wants it's to take that one? Such a good question. <laughs> Thank you for it. Uh, uh, I got, everybody knows what Van is, right? We don't need to do a step in that. But um, we, we offer Van, obviously, to all of our, our county organizations and, of course, our candidates. Our team is aggressive in their intent on training you on using Van. Um, my, my data director would love it if, if she could get, by the way, my data director is a woman, and I love that also because that's also rare. Um, 
but she, she would love it if I could tell her that she could say, you can't turn on the van until you've been through a training with her. I don't go quite that far, but I do allow her to be very aggressive in her desire to train folks. We have a group of 24 young folks doing an internship with us, which is a digital internship this summer. We call it Democracy Defenders. Really deep, you've got to get your voice deep when you say it, democracy <laughs> defenders. Um, and nothing they're doing actually touches the van, but we're doing a van training with them because if they're going to stay in this business, if they're going to continue to work here, they need to understand how that tool works and the value of that tool. Because I have to say, I've met so many people who've come into state party world and do not understand the value of all the information that's in the van. Um, and the last thing I'll say about this is we also are aggressive about making our candidates put their data back into the van. I can't tell you how many folks get it. They do an export, they make phone calls, they knock doors, and they never put the data back in the van. Like if you just use minivan, you don't have to actually do data entry, it's right there, but it's hard to get folks still to do that, but it's so important to get that information in there. It's our lifeline. It's how we make sure that we know who we're talking to and what we've said to them and all of that, and if folks don't know how to use it properly, it makes it harder for those of us who actually run campaigns to get them run. So thank you for that question. And also everybody go learn how to use the van if you don't. <laughs> Anyone else want to take a swing at that? Yep. All right, let's do another question. How about you in the front, sir? Hi, yes, um, Russell Kahn from Florida, working as the vice chair of the Club and Caucus Committee for Nikki Freed. Um, what I'd like to ask um, specifically is how you as party chairs engage with your clubs and caucuses to help facilitate their effectiveness and get them knocking doors and active and energized. Um, so honestly, in the past, we really haven't done that. I feel like our, our auxiliary organizations have been some in North Carolina that have been overlooked and not resourced enough and also not utilized as resources enough. And so one of the things that we've really tried to change this year is engaging our caucuses on candidate recruitment uh, because we have had a really hard time in North Carolina. We were one of the states. Uh, we left 44 seats uncontested in 2022 for our state house and state senate seats. Uh, it was the most that we had ever left uncontested in North Carolina's history, but re-engaging our caucuses on candidate recruitment and also training with them. Our LGBTQ caucus just had its first monthly meeting last night. Um, and so really trying to get them building or building a strategic plan for how are they actually going to help us increase voter turnout in their communities, but also presence within the party too. And I think that those two things are, are hand in hand and how we're going to make those organizations more powerful, but also more membership to them, honestly, because one of the things that we're seeing across North Carolina is just the decline in caucus membership and actual ability to want to get involved with them, right? And so um, pushing that right now is something that's really big for us is just recruiting people to those organizations too. One of the things that we did that I think is replicable across the nation is we created a candidates of color fund with the Latinx, Native, and Black caucuses within our state party because they were coming to us frustrated that not enough candidates of color were able to run. And so we do a joint fundraiser uh, every year uh, with them in order to put money into that. And then it's totally left up to them how it's distributed. Uh, and so the state party has no say in who it goes to. It's totally up to them. And sometimes they use the money to send candidates to trainings, like the Black Power uh, you know, training that one of the groups puts on. So that's something that I think is replicable. Th those groups, for me, are so critical because a lot of times people don't want to come to our quarterly state central committee meetings. I love them. Not everybody does. <laughs> um, I love them. But those groups then you know, are in charge of the more fun activities and the pride parades and that type of thing. So we really try to help make sure they have resources to do those things. Let's get another question. Um, yes, this lady in the black shirt. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Bailey. I'm a 15-year-old organizer with Voters of Tomorrow. Heck yeah! Wow! And um, this is a question primarily for Anderson, but feel free to, of, for any of you to jump in. Um, young people like us, especially young women, are often dismissed or told to wait our turn. Um, how do you show that we have value not despite our age, but because of our age and our unique perspective? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, A, thank you for the work that you do. I think that's so awesome and so cool. And the other side of that is that I feel like young people actually have a more or an easier way to make ourselves look more professional than what we are sometimes. Like, to be honest, one of the main things that had, and you can still go visit it, ClaytonForCarolina.com is the website that I used when I ran for state party chair. It was built by a group of young people. Everyone that worked on my campaign was below the age of 27, um, and I really pride myself on that. We had a 
Slack group of 100 people strong that were willing to get in there and do whatever they needed to do to organize. But really the sad thing is, is I think I, I part of the reason why I got elected is because we professionalized our campaign to really look like a campaign. And we showed people that young people are so capable of doing things when you put them in leadership positions. And so we had an organizing director, a campaign manager, a digital director, a website manager, uh, positions that you would normally find. And we were actually able to give each one of those people stipends too that worked on my campaign uh, because we believed in, in producing something that folks could look at and say, this is replicable too. Um, but for me in this role right now as a state party chair, what I'm trying to do is to the youth auxiliary points that I think someone asked about earlier. Um, I think that our state party really devalued teen Dems, college Dems, and young Dems. How I came into the party was as a college student and I got really involved with college Dems and I felt ownership over this party to the point where I couldn't leave it. Because right now as a 25 year old, getting involved with the Democratic Party doesn't seem like great fun, just to be real with y'all. Um, and I think that, yeah, like, and I think that there's a whole point to this to acknowledge that and say, how do we get more young people to feel ownership over the Democratic Party, to feel like they do want to be involved with it? And that's part showing them what their power is. Right now, if you're staring at TikTok on your phone, it is the world is burning. There is nothing you can do about it, and your life sucks probably because of it. And I think that that rhetoric right now that's out there dragging young people out of that mindset and saying, no, you have so much power. And that's what these people are afraid of at the end of the day is that young people and everyone, not just young people, right? Everyone's got power. And that's what Republicans are scared of. That's what extremists in our state are scared of is us coming together and realizing that. And so how do I get young people around a table mobilized with each other to say, we're not gonna take this shit anymore from the people that are with us. <laughs> and so that's what we're trying to do in North Carolina. Do another question. Is there any other? Well, let me just add that you know I know probably to to you I, as a late person in my late thirties I seem ancient, but in but <laughs> um, <laughs> but I am the youngest person to be a state party chair for the state of Washington, and I'm often by like thirty plus years the youngest person in the room that I go into in most of these party meetings and whatnot, and you know so often the framing of me coming in that being on the young side was a negative and a challenge and something to be overcome, and I have really tried to do the work to reframe it as this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to build a party that is going to be here for the next several generations who have a stake in the game because it's our lives who are gonna be facing you know, the existential crisis around climate change, right? It is us who are gonna be living with this. And yet, at the same time, many of my party members are retirees. And so I also have to be able to help create a space where they feel like they have a value add and still you know, have a lot to offer, that there's wisdom and there's work to be done I often talk about the Democratic Party as one of the first intergenerational communities that I was ever able to be a part of. And that is something that I love and I'm proud of, and I want to continue to create that. And so it takes all of us to, be, to build that. And so I think just seeing that as a positive and an opportunity and not just something that we have to like, you know, prove ourselves all of the time. And as Anderson, take that power back to know that you are showing what is possible by showing up in these rooms and these spaces and speaking your truth. Also, young people have so much excitement. And the Democratic Party is pretty not pretty not excited right now. I'm not gonna lie to y'all. So like the energy that we provide, people are like, oh my God, so much of it. <laughs> uh, the gentleman over there with the blue shirt. Hi, uh, Shri Kulkarni from Texas. First of all, you know, God bless all y'all for doing this, like running for this. Uh, it's like <laughs> running to put a bullseye on your back. And we're so proud of all the work that y'all are doing. Um, my question is about the Catch-22. We've talked a lot about organizing here. I've been a candidate and an organizer. The first time around, my, my race for Congress was off by 35 points, got no attention from the National Party, and so we could focus all on organizing, and we, got, we cut it by 30 points. Mm. The second time around, I got all this attention from the National Party, from the D-Trip. I spent all my time fundraising. I was in a room 40 hours a week fundraising. We raised 10 times as much money, and we did worse. So my question to y'all is, how do you balance, how do you prioritize between the, the fundraising that we need in order to pay county chairs and, and party and state chairs and organizers and the actual time of organizing. Uh, that is the challenge, <laughs> right? That is the Everyone's absolute number. This. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's that, that is the number. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, but I think, you know, that the case that I make to donors, and we were having this conversation right before this, is that 
we win by organizing. So, you know, there is a role, like I was saying about sort of intergenerational, there is a role for activists and donors to play. And, you know, we often talk about in the nonprofit world, time, talent, and treasure. And so if what you can give is money, great. Because guess what? I've got folks who have time and skills who would really like to be doing their spending their time organizing. So let's like get that treasure and help me cover these costs for organizing. Um, I do have, you know, in my role, I've, I have to raise $9 million this cycle. And it's a lot, you know, and it's more than we've ever raised before. It's a, when I came into this role, I thought there's no way. But what I've been finding is that as I've been making the pitch, it's like people just want to help. And so if you can have an honest conversation about how they can help in a way in which they can easily say yes to. And I, someone was saying at one of our um, uh, ASDC meetings around, it's a lot easier to ask a donor for like, $5,000 or $10,000 if that's like nothing to them than it is to ask a single mom to put in, you know, 10 hours or spend a weekend knocking doors when they are already working two jobs, trying to take care of kids, get food on the table. And so, you know, I, we got to be able to do both and recognize what people are able to offer and just try to meet that balance. So I, I, I want to just do this plug for state parties. So th this is where your strong, well-organized state party with a good grassroots organizing infrastructure comes to play. Because while you, as a candidate for Congress, are spending your time raising money, because the DTRIP gives you higher and higher goals for how much money you need to raise, we over here at the state party are raising money to hire organizers to work with the volunteers to get those doors knocked in your district. So what has to happen is both of those things. You need a candidate who's willing to get on the phone and make the fundraising calls and raise the money and occasionally get on the doors also. And then a state party that's building that infrastructure to make sure that those doors are being knocked and those conversations are being had all the time also. I will, I will, I will say, anybody who asks me, Doors that are knocked in September are terrific, but the best doors, I think, are knocked are the ones that we're knocking right now. The conversations we're having with voters before it is election time, where we're building relationships, we're talking about the good works that happen when Democrats are elected. We do a little bit of you know, anti-Republican conversation as well. So when we come back to you for your vote in September, October, November, you've met us before. You know who we are, you know who our candidates are, and you know what we stand for. But we can't do that unless we are fully funding these state parties in order to make it happen. And I'll just say, like, there are structural things that I think many of us think do have to change on how the national party uh, committees are run. Um, so, you know, everybody has, that of course could be its own panel, but I just want to acknowledge that I do think that we have to undo some old habits um, that have been in place for too many campaign cycles in the National Party Committee structure and more money needs to come down to the state and local level because we know how to run those programs best. We know our voters best. We know messages best. We know the best consultants at the state level, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And Y'all thank you for running. State strategy. I feel sorry yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anything to add? Anyone? All right. Another question. Let's do. Oh gosh, so many, we have not enough time. How about all the way over here? Uh, hey y'all. Uh, my name is Epiphany Summers, and I'm the organizing director with Dream Defenders. We're primarily in Florida, but we're going national. Um, Come to Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question that I have is actually about Florida. Um, so I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm hearing any advice, you're like, stay in a room, all the things. So um, for those of y'all who don't know, Dream Defenders is a youth organizing organization throughout the state of Florida right now. Um, it's really felt like ever since DeSantis won, it's been really hard mm -hmm. to do anything in Florida. And um, on top of that, it's really felt like the Florida Democratic Party has been out of touch with some of the actual needs of people in communities. Um, I mean, even the year that $15 an hour like won, it was like barely on any politic like Democrats platform that year. It just won because of organizing and all the organizations that we work with and stuff that like just made sure they educated people. So I don't know, I was just wondering like, do you have any advice um, outside of stay in a room, keep the fight, because um, we, we will, you know, we're going to continue to fight, we're going to continue to find more youth, we're going to do all the fights, but I'm wondering if you have any advice for 
young organizers in, in states that are Republican run. Um, I think for this, yeah, I mean, just for quite some time and really not close to there being any any change <laughs> with that. Um, but yeah, it's just been really hard to keep young people motivated. It's been really hard to um, keep young people uh, excited about the Democratic Party. Um, it's not exactly our prerogative, but it's just been another obstacle um, to get young people involved. Um, and so I'm just wondering if y'all have any advice, again, outside of like, stay in a room, keep the mm -hmm. fight. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I'm originally from Florida, so, and I'm there once a month because my mom's in a nursing home, so I see my state, or my home state very differently, uh, and it's been heartbreaking. Um, so one, I would definitely advise you to meet with the chair. You know, I do know that she acknowledges that there's a lot of, uh, you know, broken promises and really difficult relationships that have to be mended. And sometimes I think both sides are making assumptions about how the other one's thinking or feeling or what their strategies and goals and plans are. So I would say get in the room with the chair and talk through those things. I also think that you have way more power than sometimes it feels in a, you know, with everything that's coming at you with DeSantis. But the only way that Florida is going to recover from DeSantis is the youth vote. Like, there's just no question about it. And so own that power. And when you are in those rooms, if you guys feel ignored, keep on organizing then outside the state party until uh, that value is recognized. Uh, that's what we had to do at the Young Democrats of America. We really weren't getting a lot of funding at the time from the DNC or big donors. We found one donor, Jonathan Lewis, who really believed in us. And then we proved our worth. And then we started getting invited into the room. So that would be my advice. Anderson? Screw the mic. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think that's a, it's hard, right? I feel like young people, I, I used to joke about it. I'm like, young people in North Carolina were kind of like, it's a railroad track that you're on and they had like laid their bodies out on it and the state party had literally just run it over um, every single time. And like, that is kind of how, like, I mean, young people are the backbones of our party, right? We are the ones that work on campaigns. We are the campaign managers, the organizers, the interns, the the field directors, the, the finance folks, like everybody that I've ever met on campaigns usually is below the age of 36 to some degree um, and they are are the backbone of this party, but they've never been treated like that. And, and so I think it is, to Jane's point, owning your power, being able to show people how much power you can bring. Um, and to me, the, the crazy thing to hear you say that is I'm like, I'm getting a lot of inspiration from Florida right now as a young person all across the country. And maybe we need to show Florida that, like the fact that y'all are inspiring a whole host of young people across like the United States to get up and get active and to fight for their rights in their states. Because I think that's what's inspired a lot of folks in North Carolina is looking at someone like Maxwell Frost getting elected out of Florida, right? And like, that's a huge power that y'all have there that I think is like, and it makes some, and I, I'll say that too, though. I'm like, people look at me like that in North Carolina and then, but people in North Carolina are like, but you're just Anderson at the end of the day. So people might feel that way about Maxwell Frost too in Florida. And so I'm like, there may be some, some dip their dats in that. But I think it's like, how do we all, how do you utilize like this progressive network nationally to also give y'all that like boost that you need on the ground of being like, you're not alone either fighting in a red state that is run by Republicans right now. I've got a democratic governor in North Carolina is not really worth anything at this moment in time because of a Republican supermajority in a legislature that has literally uh, struck him of every single bit of power that he's got, right? And so I'm like commiserating on that and like how do we bring together this youth power nationally to inspire ourselves, to re-energize ourselves and to keep the whole concept going of like, we're not alone in this movement. And the minute that we think that we are is the minute we lose every bit of power that we have. But thank you for the work that you do, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'll just quickly say it's not exactly maybe advice for you, but something that I've been working on at the state party is developing a better pipeline to support our young people to make sure that they are getting paid sustainable, like real living wages in this political work, that we have an on-ramp into this work and we also have an off-ramp so that when a campaign ends in November and you've got someone sitting in October trying to figure out how they're going to pay for rent, we know exactly where they're going to go. We know that we've got them set up for another job where there's going to be good pay. They know where they're going to be and also 
also that we're thinking about sustainable organizing to keep people in communities, particularly our rural communities, for more than just one campaign cycle. And so that's something that I think we gotta be doing this work everywhere to build this pipeline because we are letting our young people down over and over again. And you know, I was that young person in 08 in, on Obama who didn't know where I was, my next paycheck was gonna come from and had mentors not been there to help pick me up and get that next job for me, you know, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't still be in politics. So I think that's something that all of us in all of these different organizations and state parties and whatnot have to really think about how we build this. And also to give credit where the credit's due, the union movement and labor movement has really led. Um, uh, we, were, yeah. we were the first state party to unionize. And that, you know, that it's, a, it's a major change when you have workers who have rights who are gonna like stand up and do the collective bargaining and whatnot to make sure that they are paid fairly and that this is a place where they want to stay and work. I just quickly want to, because of what Jane said is so important about having that conversation with the state party chair, um, two things I would suggest. One is if, if you've got a project that you can legally, because there's all kinds of rules about what you can and cannot do with state party, but that you can partner with that state party on, take it to her, because my, my guess is that this current chair would be very interested in hearing that and partnering with you on that. And number two, um, I think that conversations with state parties help a lot of people level set about what state parties can and cannot do. A lot of times I get people who come to me and ask me why I haven't done X, Y, and Z, and it turns out it's not legal for me to do X, Y, and Z. <laughs> so I, I think that like having those conversations, which I know this current chair in Florida is willing to have, will be so important to helping you all figure out where those synergies are with the state party and helping her move forward and helping you guys move forward too. And thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. And come to Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> so we are just about out of time. Unfortunately, we're able to take any more questions. But I wanted to pose something very quickly to all of you to ask you in 20 seconds or less, what is something that you're looking forward to in the next cycle? Mm. Let's just say, take a second to think about it. Ready, go. Oh my God, following the Michigan model, I want to be able to build out my regional organizing director program. Shout out LaVore Barnes. Awesome. All right. All right. All right. We're leaning in heavy on state ledge races, so we're going to have 20 Democrats in 24. Hey. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Love it. What are you looking forward to? I'm going to hold a giant U.S. Senate seat, and I'm also excited about holding and growing this state house majority that we just picked up. Yes. Here. yes. Oh, we need that. Yes. We're doing it. In my blue state, I am going for super majorities. Yeah. I'm excited to change my constitution. Listen, I have to say this is an invigorating and refreshing talk by uh, state party chairs. This is the kind of this is the kind of leadership that I think our country needs, our party needs, and so therefore our country needs going forward. This is giving me a lot of enthusiasm uh, to continue supporting the Democratic Party. I hope for all of you, it think it triggers thoughts about how you can work with, improve upon maybe even like jostle a little bit your own state parties where you are there's some great ideas and even literally materials you can yes, come here. take it shout out Jane, <laughs> shout out Jane. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming and thank you to these state party chairs Woo! Great job. Yes, take these are it. cool I'm the only one also Jane brought materials hi, hi. I'm meeting with all ladies next hi